Okay, let's dive in. And if anybody else rocks up, then I'll admit them. But this lesson, which you might have already seen, is all about oral techniques. So we're up to step eight in the literary analysis process. So I'll be introducing the reading for this week. It's about 10 or 11 pages or something like that. Not a huge reading, uh, just taking you through different sound patterns in literature. Um, so let's just rehash though. I've got here the imagery uh, one. So this was two weeks ago we did this lesson. So this is the uh, seventh step in the literary analysis process imagery. So I just wanted to touch on this because Geraldine Brooks' speech even though it's a speech and she's using lots of rhetorical conventions, it's a very image-driven speech. She uses a lot of narrative features. And because she's a writer, um, she's written novels, she's a journalist, she writes in lots of different modes. So we see a lot of blending of different forms of writing. So you'll see elements of prose, a lot of personal anecdotes, and a lot of imagery. Um, so particularly visual imagery. It seems like the visual images are very strong. There's not so much olfactory imagery um, or the, the kinesthetic and all of that. She uses visual imagery, figurative language, um, which we'll have a look at as well. So I think um, as we're reading through Brooke's speech, just pay attention to how different her speech is for, from some of the others that you might have read, um, just in terms of how she's using imagery metaphor, motifs, symbolism, um, and some of those different devices. So I've got here the visual imagery um, <clears throat> where they're painting mental pictures in the reader's mind, in the listener's mind. So she does that right from the beginning of the speech. So we can pay attention to that and analyze it immediately. Auditory imagery, not so much. On, and olfactory, as I said, gustatory, no, she's not talking about anything taste, but um, more the nature imagery, I think. Uh, we'll pay attention to organic imagery that she uses. She references trees, um, branches, uh, and there's also imagery of the, the wood house and the temple and, and other aspects of um, man-made structures as well. So we've got imagery depicting nature, and then we also have imagery depicting um, man-made buildings. Uh, so we'll have a look at that as well. And lots of metaphor, a few similes we'll be identifying. So keep your eye out for those. Plenty of sim symbolism um, to look out for. So I just wanted to point that out because there's there's a lot going on in terms of those unusually for a speech. Uh, so yeah, let's now have a look at the step eight. Here we go. So for this reading, if you can have a read through this this week, it's just an introduction to different oral devices. And oral devices are, are a tricky one when we're trying to discuss the effect as well. You know, you think, well, other than, yep, it grabs our attention, sustains engagement of the reader, you know, creates interesting sounds, musicality in a text. What else does it do? So I spent a fair bit of time here elaborating on uh, what sound patterns in literature actually do and what effect they have on readers and listeners. Um, so have a read through this, you know, enhancing the auditory experience. So we're appealing to multiple senses, not just, um, you know, visual or tactile or whatever it is we're, we're hearing, hearing sounds and sound patterns in the literature. Um, eliciting emotions and building atmosphere is another key effect of sound patterns and the way they function in different texts. Um, creating memorable phrases, so think patterns in, that stick in our minds long after we've finished reading the text, uh, and then engaging readers. So how exactly do different sound techniques engage us as readers? Emphasising key aspects. So a lot of the time, sound patterns are often repetitive, so there can be re repeated sounds like assonance, alliteration, consonance, uh, rhyme, all of that is the, the repetition of different sound patterns. Uh, so often it will be used for emphasis. So that's always when you're thinking about, when you're analyzing uh, the effect of a particular sound device or oral technique, have a think about which of these effects best fit the quote that you're analyzing. And then you'll be able to elaborate and explain the effect and, and evaluate its effectiveness a little bit in, with a little bit more depth. 
rather than just going to the sort of run of the mill and this emphasizes um you know this aspect or this grabs our attention and you can go that little that step further with that analysis um, dialogue and speech patterns we can have a look at a little bit of that in in brooke's work today um, syntax the structure of sentences where um, sometimes when a writer is purposely uh, using short, sharp sentences and then, you know, inversion of syntax or um, long, complicated, complex sentences, uh, sometimes we have <clears throat> that can also create distinctive sound patterns as well. Sorry, my voice hasn't quite recovered from my last week's illness, but it's fine. It doesn't, I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's just a bit croaky. Um, Okay, so and that's sort of it for a little bit of repetition today. We will look at, as I said, the, there's a fair bit of alliteration, some sibilance, um, and the repetition of words. Assonance is another key one in speeches. So we will be looking for how these apply and along with the imagery to Brooke's speech. So we're thinking about rhetorical conventions, so speech conventions, um, and how Brooks is using a combination of these different language features to construct her speech. So it's not just a really clear cut, um, typical speech that we would usually listen to, how she is blending all of these different elements. Um, so yeah, have a read through that this week. This is just a little intro to what you can expect in the reading. Also, I've added in audio visual elements in multimedia literature, because quite often these days we consume literature in different forms using different multimedia. Um, you know, it's, whether it's an audio book, um, you know, there's a lot of um, adaptations of, of literature where they're, you know, redone in a short film. Um, so it's important to also look at how uh, those elements of, of a multimedia text can also affect our reading experience as well. So yeah, have a read through that um, as well and the influence of historical and cultural context as well. So you know, whether a text was written in the Romantic era or the Modernist um, era can also affect the, the sound patterns that are common to the text. So, for example, in Romantic literature, like the poetry of William Wordsworth, William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the like, um, we see a lot of the rhythm and the patterns of the sound, a lot of sibilance that creates sort of hushed, serene environments, um, you know, where we sort of, you know, can slow down our reading rather than speed it up. Whereas when we're reading, um, you know, texts like, you know, the work of T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, um, we've got a lot more of, as we spoke about when we looked at Rhapsody on a Windy Night, a lot of that fragmented, disjointed style of language and the sounds created by that kind of language are, have a more short, sharp, staccato effect. It's like the patterns of of um, you know human thought where where thoughts just pop into your mind haphazardly. So the sound patterns in the literature can help to enhance that effect as well. So yeah, a little overview there and then wrapping up with common oral techniques, um, just definitions and examples there. So that is the reading task for this week. Read it at your leisure. And without further ado, let's take a look at the speech extract. So it's the exordium of a home in fiction, so which is the opening of the speech. Exordium is just a fancy word for the opening. Um, I've chosen this speech because it has so much going for it in terms of the imagery um, and it, the, the way that it engages us as a listener right from the get-go. So Geraldine Brooks, even though she's a very accomplished writer, uh, we can immediately relate to her. She sort of establishes ethos in a way in as she opens her speech where we think, oh, this is, you know, familiar. I can relate to that feeling and that experience and that way of thinking. Uh, so we can see how how she really gets our attention, engages us immediately and gets us thinking about quite deep and complex intellectual ideas about humanity, you know, human nature, um, you know, from, from a philosophical perspective in a lot of ways. Um, she does it in such a, a light-hearted, playful way uh, and in, in using personal anecdote where it doesn't feel quite so serious. But the, this is in the opening, the, the, the speech as it develops, and I've got the whole speech text in the lesson content if you want to read the whole thing. But today we're just focusing in on the opening. Um, then it does become a little bit more serious in tone as she, she delves into issues. So she reels us in with a lighthearted tone in the beginning. So we can look at how she does that 
through the use of the first person voice and the personal anecdote um, and the, the imagery. And then, then she sort of sets up the speech so then she can go into the heavier issues, but she's got the, re the, the listener hooked already. So, okay, I won't go into it. Um, any, I'll, I'll analyse it after. So, the, uh, okay, this speech was delivered at the Boyer Lectures 2011 uh, for a series called The Idea of Home for ABC Radio. So it was a broadcast series of lectures on the 11th of December 2011, a little bit of context there. Let's go. A few years ago, on a crisp autumn day in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I attended a lecture entitled Singularities in Algebraic Plane Curves. For reasons that I will not go into, it was necessary that I attend. I slumped into the room, armed with a doodle pad. My plan was to sit politely and let the talk sail over my head. I would use the hour for meditative re reverie, perhaps. If I positioned myself wisely, a discreet little nap might be possible. On the pad I carried that day, I have a few fragments of the sentences the mathematician used. A formal power series about the origin is an infinite sum. Homomorphism is an isomorphism, if and only if the matrix is inevitable. This is like poetry, I thought, and I leaned forward to hear more. The mathematician was eloquent, she was passionate, and when I set aside my firm belief that I could not comprehend her, something strange happened. It wasn't that I understood her work, but I understood her vision. I realised I had lived until that moment in an airlock and that she was prizing open the heavy door just to crack. In the sudden brief shaft of light, I glimpsed a sliver of the world beyond, the world in which she lived. When she looked at the old maple tree, the, sorry, the old maple beyond the lecture room window, at the great swoop of bough arcing out from massive trunk, her consciousness overlaid a pattern on that branch that was elegant and sensual. I could imagine for a moment what it was to see with her eyes, to feel with her heart, to inhabit a space in which the language was not particular and national, but infinite and universal. A world in which every object sang to her with its own particular music, chiming out in delicate arpeggios and thundering chords. I know now that it is a beautiful world, but I also know that I can't live there. If she has lungs, I have gills. I swim in a sea of words. They flow around me and through me and by a process that is not fully clear to me, some delicate hidden membrane draws forth the stuff that is the necessary condition of my life. I am sure, though, that our work, the mathematician's and mine, is essentially the same. In her exploration of the singularity in every plane curve, she seeks a way to more perfectly describe that arcing branch or a soaring bridge, the squiggle in the iron lace of a terrace house, the quivering s-bend of a squirrel's upraised tail. She pushes her way deeper and deeper into the full truth of the world. This also is what I must do. It is my great good luck that I use, that the words I use are English words, which means I live in a very old nation of open borders, a rich, deep, multi-layered, promiscuous universe infused with Latin, German, French, Greek, Arabic, and countless other tongues. I would not be able to swim so far, dive so deep in a linguistically isolated language such as Hungarian, or even a protectively elitist one such as French. When I write a word in English, a simple one, such as, say, chief, I have unwittingly ushered a querulous horde into the room. The Roman legionary is there, shaking his cap or head, and our cap is there, slouching in his signature working man's headgear. The toque-wearing cook is there too, reminding me that English had chef from the French, who had changed the Roman's k sound to sh and the p sound to f before it had captain, from the Latin, which is why the word chief now sounds more like the younger word than its elder. So is the English root of chief properly described as French, from which English first borrowed it, or Latin from which it originated. I don't know what a linguistics expert or a lexicographer would say, but as a novelist, I'm glad to have this immense cast of captains and chefs standing behind my chief telling me that whoever she is in my novel, she trails a vast raft of history and association behind her, subtly framing her in my readers' minds before I have let her utter, utter a single word. 
Henry David Thoreau wrote that the youth gets together with he gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon or perchance a palace or a temple on the earth and at length the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with them. Well, it did not go that way for me. I started out hoping for the woodshed, a nice, tight, serviceable structure that would serve a modestly useful purpose. I would be a newspaper reporter in the city of my birth. I would try to write stories that helped people, perhaps. Every so often an article might right a local wrong or even shift policy a few degrees in a more progressive direction. But generally, my stories would be useful simply by offering an informative, entertaining read. Then they'd end up lining the floor of the budgie cage. In my 20s, unexpected doors opened for me and my ambition enlarged a bit. I started thinking that building a temple might not be out of the question. As a foreign correspondent bearing witness in the dark and troubled places of the earth, I began to entertain a hope that my words might have an impact on the counsels of the powerful. I hoped they would be a true and valuable reflection of the history unfolding before my eyes. That first rough draft that historians and analysts would turn to as they shaped a better understanding of our times. Now, as a fiction writer, my ambition has slipped all reasonable bounds. Now, in middle age, I aspire to build that bridge to the moon. Like the mathematician, I am after nothing less than eternal truths. What is this world? How can we more perfectly describe it? Who are we? Who have we been? Of course, it is one thing to have the ambition, another thing to have the means. But I know I have to do the best I can with the materials I have to hand. Materials that I started assembling from the time I became literate and have continued to amass throughout my career in journalism and on into fiction. By now, the toolbox has grown quite heavy and some of the first acquired implements continue to be the most useful of my craft. Okay, so that is the opening of the speech. She shifts gears after this section. Um, but this, this part of the speech, I think, is is a good one to analyze in you know in in one whole because she's moving towards some key ideas she's establishing some key ideas and values and then she's moving you know towards developing those so we can have a think about what exactly she's doing here now this speech I can't remember if I mentioned it before is actually a HSC advanced mod C text at the moment for the craft of writing module so uh, in light of that I have included the body paragraph structure um, task that I usually do, an analytical task, so you can choose to do that. The focus question is how does Brooks use rhetorical conventions in a home in fiction to engage the audience in deep intellectual exploration? So we will consider that as we're analysing it as well. And then, and I'll break this down a little bit more later, and then the creative writing and reflection. So... Um, this this task is designed to mirror the style of task that you could be given in Mod C in Year 12. Uh, so this is just identifying some stylistic uh, features from the text and then completing a short uh, piece. It can be prose, discursive, um, narrative, rhetoric, whatever style or a blend like, like Brooks uses and then the reflection task as well. So we can discuss that a little bit later as well, but just so you know where we're heading and, and why we're talking about certain features, we're not going to be just analysing the text, but also thinking about how can we use this um, extract from the speech as a springboard for, for, for creative and imaginative thought as well, because ultimately that's sort of one of Brooks' values as well is that it's not just about intellectual exploration is not just about, um, you know, academic rigour. It's about creative and emotional, um, imaginative um, pursuits as well. So I think it sort of, it lends itself to considering um, those sorts of ideas, um, this speech. So let's go jump across to the 10 step analysis and I'll, I'll come across here and we can have a little uh, look at, I'm just going to jot a few things down for context. So uh, you probably won't know the exact context. So I'll, I'll jot some of those down actually while I wait for you to have a think about and maybe put something in the comments if you can about who you think, what you think Brooke's purpose might be 
And are there any values evident? So I would like, while I, I'll jot in some um, details while you have a think about purpose of the speech, just from what you've read so far, and what are Brooks' values as evident in the speech that you, what the extract that you've read so far? You have a think about that. And I'm just going to pop in a few notes and have a quick drink of water. <laughs> so purpose and values, what do you think they might be? Let me just enlarge this in case you've, I don't know if I've, if you're in this screen, I don't know if I can often always see the chat happening. Why can't I see the chat? Has anyone added anything for context and purpose? Maybe that's why I can't see it because nobody has written a comment yet. <laughs> Let me see. Can you just let me know if anyone has put anything in the comments? No, the chat, there's nothing in the chat yet. Okay, so purpose and values, please. Any ideas? Okay, so hopefully that will pop up. And then let's have a little, so I've put here Australian born writer and journalist. We know that it was delivered at the, delivered at the prestigious Boyer Lectures um, in 2011. Um, and that will probably be as much as I'll go into detail on that one. Um, what is Brooke's purpose? So, um, while I'm still waiting for any contributions to pop through it all. So the, the lecture series, the theme was um, the idea of home. And so lots of different speakers would have spoken about this idea, this concept of home. And Brooks has chosen to talk about how she discovered a home in fiction. So through even just the extracts that we read, we see how she's moved from, um, you know, having quite modest, humble aspirations as a writer to then, yeah, I like that, Elise. Thank you. How fiction reflects real life. Um, the idea of home. Yeah, so how she's actually developed. Um, Brooks has developed a solidified sense of purpose as a writer. Uh, what is her sense of purpose? What? How does she perceive, how does Brooks perceive her role as a writer? What does she think? Why, why is writing, why is her writing important to her? That's what we can think about. Brooks' purpose is to describe the similarity between a mathematician and an author as they both delve into the world of language. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's interesting because we've got Brooks who is a writer and we have the, the mathematician who is um, looking at the world through a completely different lens, uh, yet they're both on a quest for truth. 
So I think part of it is to, um, you know, consider the connections between, um, you know, different ways of perceiving the world. You know, whether you're a mathematician or an artist or a, a scientist or, um, or a writer, at the heart of those intellectual forms of intellectual exploration is this quest for truth and, and what does it mean to be human? Um, and so those rhetorical questions that we, we saw towards the end of that extract, um, you know, where she says, sorry, that's in my way, move over. Yeah, now as a fiction writer, my ambition has slipped. No, the, yeah, these ones. I am after nothing, after nothing less than eternal truths. What is this world? How can we more perfectly describe it? Who are we? Who have we been? I think there's a little bit there that we can say about her purpose, as well as here towards the end where she says, where, you know, she makes the connection here between her own quest as a writer and the quest of the mathematician. She pushes her way deeper and deeper into the full truth of the world. This also is what I must do. So that's where we see that quest for truth, that universal quest for truth. Um, we can also consider that part of her purpose is, um, you know, she's sharing quite interesting perspectives on concepts of identity as well and what it means to be human. Um, what's deep consideration of and also like what brings value to humanity? Um, deep questions um, about identity and belonging she's engaging us in. might leave that there and then I think also as well um, we can't move past this idea of the power of storytelling as well as a way of communicating the complexities and nuances of human experience um, as a medium for exploring and expressing the complexities of human experience uh, because ultimately that's the medium that she's using in this speech as well. The fact that she's using a personal anecdote and a narrative to immediately share this idea, um, you know, shows that she sees storytelling as, you know, the most powerful way to get through to people and engage them um, because it's through the sharing of stories that we can connect with people on a deeper emotional and intellectual level where we can sort of overcome any um you know notions of difference as well you know when she sat down in that lecture initially to you know listen to a mathematician speak she's reluctant she's thinking i'm just going to have a nap um you know I'm, i'll be probably tuning out and not understanding a word this woman has to say and then after a little bit you know she starts um you know reflecting on on her experiences and that that transformative shift she has as she's listening to the mathematician speak um and and through that process of telling the story you know brooks is engaging us to think about well yeah how would i respond in that situation um you know brooks is reflecting on how she's feeling what she's thinking in the moment as the mathematician is speaking so it becomes more real and tangible when you try to convey ideas through a story um as opposed to say if she just got up there and started talking about these ideas in just a, a generalized way you know just saying out loud um you know I, I need to tell you that one thing I've learned about about the power, about writing is that storytelling is a powerful medium for exploring and expressing the complexities of human experience. We'd be like, yeah, okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, that's dry language. And yes, we're using it now to analyze the speech. But if you're an orator and you get up to deliver a speech, um, you know, quite often you'll see that they bring these these storytelling um, strategies into their speech to engage us and bridge that gap and to overcome differences. Um, and also, I think part of building ethos as a speaker, especially if some members of your audience might not know you, I mean, a lot of the people that listened to uh, Brooks 
speak on this day would have been familiar with her work. Um, you know, she's she's speaking to, um, you know, academic, potentially, you know, educated, upper middle class, um, you know, people that would be familiar with her work as a foreign correspondent and a journalist and probably aware of her, um, you know, her, her career um, development as well. Um, you know, she's overcoming any potential objections that the audience might have if they're sitting there listening and they might be a scientist or a mathematician or, you know, thinking, oh, what can I learn from a writer? What can I possibly learn from a journalist? And, and immediately she's winning us over to think, well, hey, if she can sit there in the audience of a mathematician when she's a writer and knows nothing about maths and still find a connection to the subject and find a shared commonality, you know, that quest for universal human truths, um, then that's having the effect of, of engaging her audience as well and getting them on her side. So then when she does delve into the heavier stuff, they're already on board and they're listening to her. Um, okay, intended audience. I'm, I'm just going to put a few comments there, but I'll flesh this out later when I upload the with notes version of this. Um, I'm just going to say potentially academic, educated audience, um, likely familiar with her work and career. But um, from a mix of fields. So that affects her strategy for engaging them, which is what I was just talking about there. Um, values, did anybody hazard a guess at the values there? Um, I'm just going to pop a few in and because I want to um, jump into the figurative language and the metaphor and all that stuff. Um, so values evident in the speech. Any ideas? I'm going to just offer an appreciation for the power of storytelling. Literature. To... Um, on a oppressed voices and um, reveal shared human truths. Uh, she also values humility. We see that she's not up there pompous and, um, you know, she's, she's there with a humble tone um, we see that she, you know, values, she's coming from her own place of, of understanding and education, but she's not imposing that on other people. Um, she's not trying to be this authority figure in her field. She's just sharing her experiences from her perspective. Um, so I think humility is another one. Any other ideas? Um, personal narrative and um, introspection, reflection. She's definitely putting a lot of value in those aspects of exploration, imagination, and creativity. Uh, the quest for truth. Okay, I'll leave that there. As I said, I'll, I'll keep expanding those. Any, I, any ideas for the big ideas or the textual form aspect of this speech? What are the main, if you said, what is the opening extract about here? What would you say? Ideas in this extract. What are the key messages? What, what do we take away? we take away from this extract have a think about that how life is an ongoing quest of self-discovery and improvement yes i love that life as an ongoing quest for self-discovery and improvement yeah excellent thanks for that michael um i think as well a part of what she's getting at here um, along with, yes, we've touched on the transformative power of storytelling. That could be another key idea that you could explore, a big idea you could explore. Um, I think another one is this idea of the value of curiosity. 
and open-mindedness. Mindedness to alternative um, ways of perceiving uh, because we've got her initial reluctance and then she shows her transformation where she embraces the perspective or engages with it. You know, she goes from being sort of disinterested in what the mathematician has to say to being curious and open-minded about it. So I think she shows the value of that as, you know, part of the process of intellectual explore exploration. So that's definitely something you could think about when you're answering the question, the focus question for this text. Any other ideas there? Any other messages that you would take away from it? Um, the evolving nature of our hopes and aspirations as individuals, um, personal growth and transformation are key to this process. Okay, so there's some big ideas you can work with. There's, there's a few more as well. And obviously the quest for truth. as a point of connection between people from different backgrounds. So we can find connection with others that seemingly share a completely different point of view. If we're open, if we're curious, um, you know, if we're, we can look at as well what connects us rather than what makes us different. Um, we can deepen our connections with others and the world if we focus on what connects us rather than makes us different. Okay, so a little bit of brainstorming there. I think I'll leave the big ideas there. There's plenty. Um, what I will do is come back to textual form. Um, I'm just going to jot in here that it is very image driven, um, personal narratives, um, personal narrative shapes the style, shapes the rhetoric. Um, lots of imagery, but we will touch on that shortly when we get down to the imagery part. The language style, describe distinctive elements of the language style. What would you say the language style is? Um, you know, and how does she engage us through the language style? How does she make it relatable? I think it's it's quite conversational, isn't it? Um, a conversational tone or register. Um, in places, it's quite informal. In other places, it's it's a it's a blend of formal academic writing and um, informal conversational language. Yes, long descriptive passages, absolutely. Long descriptive passages. Um, I would also say that it's um, sort of personal. Um, invites um, intimacy with the perspective of the speaker. She doesn't distance herself from us. She draws us in through her story and her, um, you know, she's she's not vulnerable and emotional, but she shares her inner thoughts and feelings. And we'll touch on that more in more depth when we get to the voice of the text. Um, it's very metaphorical, but another aspect, we'll, I'll deepen that later, but I think is the sense of humour as well. Humour is a device used in a lot of speeches to create that light-hearted tone, light-hearted, uh, playful tone that draws us in uh, and makes the ideas relatable uh you know it's it, it is humorous when she says things at the beginning there uh like i would use the out she's armed with a doodle pad 
um, which shows her intentions. It might look like a notebook to other people, but she's just going to be doodling, which sort of shows that she's intending to be absent-minded going into it. Um, she goes in as well with the plan to just let the talk sail over her head, which is a, a funny metaphor there for, you know, she's intending to just to not really engage with the ideas, uh, which is ironic because she ends up engaging as well so it's sort of an ironic um twist there when she starts to lean forward and and really pay attention and and you know connect with the mathematician's purpose and perspective um and then more humor here perhaps if i positioned myself wisely a discreet little nap might be possible uh so yeah i mean and that's relatable for anyone that has sat in at university or, or in the classroom and has sat through long tedious lectures she's expecting this to potentially be long and tedious to the point where she's going to be doodling and then maybe have a nap um so yeah she's um setting us up here for a transition in perspective through that through that sense of humor so i think the the humor there is what also draws us in um and the personal anecdotes, um, it's anecdotal in style. And the voice of the text, what is the narrative perspective of the speech? If we had to identify that, what are, first person, brilliant, thank you. What are the um, effects? of this perspective in this speech. So if we're thinking about, yes, it's first person, how does that serve her purpose? If we think about, remember when we spoke about the conventions of rhetoric and we spoke about um, pathos, ethos and logos, uh, which is really, you know, showing that, you know, orators need to appeal to the, um, to the audience on an emotional level. Um, they need to be relatable and credible. And the audience needs to perceive um, the logic and, or reason of their message. Uh, so I think the first person voice re here really allows um, the audience, I'm just going to write this down here, audience, to connect with Brooks' experiences on an emotional and intellectual level. Any other ideas there? What is the first person voice doing? What what point of view, what 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 perspective does first person narrative voice put us in? Um, you know, it's subjective. We have direct access to the speaker's inner world. Any other ideas there? It builds intimacy and connection with the speaker. Well, I'll just say between the audience and the speaker. Allows people to shift their perspective to the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the correction. I, I had a, an inkling what you meant. Um, allow people, allows people to shift their perspective to that of the speaker. Yeah, absolutely, because if we're relating to them on a personal level, then we're going to start to buy into their message. And a few other things that I'll talk about, because I think that when you're talking about if you're going to do the analytical paragraph on this speech, um, or if you want to use first person voice in your creative writing piece that you do for this lesson, um, then when you're reflecting on that, when you're thinking consciously about how and, and why you're going to be using this particular narrative voice. Um, you know, it's important to think about exactly what, what effect this is going to have on your reader. Um, particularly if you're thinking about crafting a, a character 
um, from the first person perspective in a creative writing piece, um, often people don't do so much introspection when they're learning to write creatively. They don't do enough introspection and reflection from the point of view. Uh, Miss, sorry to interrupt her, uh, but like I, I have training out. I just want to wish no you like, happy Thanks, Easter Michael. and see you next week. Yes, you too. Happy Easter. See Thank you later. You. Thank you for the lesson, Miss. See you next week. No worries. Bye. Bye. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, so uh, I've lost my train of thought there, but that's okay. Uh, there was a few other things I just wanted to, emotional resonance you can talk about as an effective first person and also how it builds authenticity, which also adds to ethos. Authenticity, yeah, that adds to development of ethos. So there's lots you can talk about when you're analyzing the voice of a text. Sometimes people just think, oh, it's just first person voice. What is, you know, that that's too simple a technique for me to analyze. But if you unpack it and really skillfully, you know, develop um, the, the effect that it's having for the particular text that you're analyzing, I think if you, you could do some nice compounded analysis of how Brooks is using first person narrative voice to engage the audience in this, you know, power of storytelling um, and to build ethos, um, you know, to connect with her audience and, and get them on side with her message. Uh, there's a lot you can unpack with this. Okay, so let's get into the layers of symbolism and imagery and figurative language. So I'm just going to put here, um, can you identify any examples of um, symbolism, imagery, or figurative language, which is metaphor, simile, anything like that. Okay. So feel free to open up this document for, of the speech on your screen as maybe a second window. It might be helpful if I've got my screen on the 10-step analysis, um, then maybe you can be looking at the speech itself and having a look for, having a scan. What, what this 10-step analysis process does is, obviously you don't have to do it in this order. Um, you don't have to analyze the text in an explicit process. Um, you definitely don't. And quite often when you're annotating a text, that's not how you do it. You're reading each line and you're scanning for different devices and, and the meaning created. Um, but what I'm teaching you here is by putting it into a methodical process is just getting you to, attuning you to think about all of these different layers of a text, all these different elements and, and sort of challenging you to address each one of them and think about, is, is there any evident um, any examples of this particular um, technique in this text? Uh, because generally we'll be able to um, you know, find all 10 of these in any text. So it's just training your mind to scan for the text, scan through the text and, and pay attention to each of these different features. So if you can grab the, the speech um, in a different screen, have a scan for any evidence of symbolism, imagery, and figurative language now, um, and see if you can find anything, anything that jumps out. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to carry on with giving you a few examples here of the symbols that are evident and the imagery. Um, one symbol that I would like to, oh, excellent, Elise, thank you. Yeah, literary illusion, I might put that here. Extended metaphor, yeah, excellent. Of the toolbox and materials. Yeah, absolutely. 
I'm going to pop the textual form. I'm going to put rhetorical questions up here. And then I'm also going to pop that down in repetition as well, forms of repetition. So we have the repetition of the inclusive we pronoun in the rhetorical questions. So the rhetorical questions that Elise has offered here are the how can we more perfectly describe it? Who are we? Who have we been? Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so let's just look at, I'm going to put autumn here. Feel free to keep analysing and identifying any of those aspects. So a time um, that symbolizes um, transition, transformation, renewal. And we know that it's a, a moment of renewal in perspective for Brooks. Um, we also have the, um, the symbolism of the setting, the symbolic setting um, of the lecture room and the doodle pad, uh, these are symbols of academia, which form a connection to her academic audience. Uh, we can also look at the, um, <clears throat> the symbols of the maple tree, the, brand, the boughs, um, and the bridge. These are all symbols of different facets of human experience. You could talk about those. Okay, imagery, visual imagery. Obviously, we have the, um, the opening imagery. Of the, what was it? The autumn day. In Massachusetts, we had the, just got a copy of the speech here. We've got a lot of awesome day. We've got the nature imagery, nature or organic imagery. The tree and the boughs and the autumn. Uh, we have also literary and artistic imagery that you could look at. So feel free to unpack the imagery as it is evident in the text, but I want to, if you're doing the body paragraph structure, figurative language, I want to spend a little bit more time on the use of metaphor, because it's quite extensive. There's a lot of different metaphors. We have um, the metaphor of the let the talk sail over my head. Any other metaphors that you recognise? Um, which captures her initial um, disinterest. Uh, we have the more metaphor of the um the airlock um, and the door opening which reflects the um glimpse of a different version of reality a different perspective um and the shift in perspective this facilitates. Um, any other metaphors? Have you seen any in there? There's a few more in here. There's also the just a crack. Opening it just a crack as well is significant. Why is that? Why? How is that metaphorical? Opening it just a crack. So it's sort of a, it's a, a moment of intellectual breakthrough and discovery there. 
It's that idea that if we're just open and curious enough to let a little bit of light in, to open that door even just a little bit, then we can have those breakthroughs. We can have, you know, discover new perspectives. So it's that idea that through curiosity and open-mindedness, we can open open those doors that have been, you know, heavily locked. You know, she talks about the airlock, which, you know, is like a barrier between two very different environments. You know, if you think about an airlock in a submarine or something like that, where you need to, um, you know, create a pressurized environment um, to, you know, seal air in or out, um, then, you know, that's, that's quite a, a strong, um, you know, something you, you need some force to to pry that open um and it needs to be an intentional prying of it open so curiosity and open-mindedness is part of that intent is is that intention um brings that intention out in people so that they can then you know if you're if you're closed-minded and you're just going to like she initially was and sh and shut off to alternative perspectives then that airlock will never be broken. You might stay in your own echo chamber forever. Um, so that's where she's really, I think, espousing the value of curiosity and open-mindedness as the doorway into, um, you know, opening, you know, those little, getting those little glimpses that lead to a, an intellectual breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So that also links well to the question, the focus question about intellectual exploration and the process of that. Um, prizing open of the heavy door is another metaphor. And we're nearly finished. The other things that I think you could talk about is the extended metaphor of yielding as well. Um, Elise alluded to this um, by looking at the extended metaphor of the toolbox. Um, of the, um, of yielding. To reflect the um, evolving aspirations as part of the um intellectual exploration development so initially it's the aspiring for the woodhouse then it was the aspiring for the temple and then it was the bridge to the moon so you can consider how that you know, builds a, you know, a stronger picture using visual imagery, using those metaphors to show the evolution of her aspirations and, and what effect that has on us. And, and how does that invite us to also reflect on our own aspirations and where we're at on that spectrum of, you know, are we aspiring for a wood house or are we at a time in our life where we're reaching for the moon? Where do we fit on that spectrum as well? Um, and then just very quickly, I just wanted to, um, give you a few ideas if you wanted to analyze there's a fair bit of sibilance happening um, in there which is the alliteration of s so have a look at that in um you know the singularity in every plane curve she seeks away um there's the soaring bridge the squiggle in the iron lace of a terrace house um yeah there's there's a lot of alliteration there um repetition there's also a lot of anaphora so not not a lot. I would say there's a few a few key examples. Um, you have the um, repetition of now, <clears throat> now as a fiction writer, and then da, 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 and then she says now in middle age, which places us into the present moment. We understand her solidified sense of purpose as a writer now. She's discovered her home in fiction. She's realized her sense of purpose. And, and why fiction is so important to her as a mode of writing. So she's gone from journalistic styles of writing where she's reporting on the facts of the world and now she's seeing that imagination um, can be explored and, and actually broaden your right horizons as a writer to open up different ways of expressing ideas um, in the world. So she's found her home in fiction. Um, she sees that fiction is the most powerful form of writing for her to delve into, you know, in, in her quest for truth and me deeper meaning. Um, and contrast, just one um, aspect of contrast that I wanted to talk about, you could look at, um, I did mention earlier the irony um, in her initial reluctance that she sets up and her um, later discoveries 
And there's a lot of juxtaposition as well. You could you could analyze as well. Uh, so juxtaposition of her early career and her current aspirations. Um, there's that antithesis of the you know her her modesty and then her her grand ambitions for the future. Um, so you could analyze those. So let's um, feel free to, if you have to go, I'll only be a few more minutes, um, but if you have to go, that's no problem. I won't be offended. Uh, but otherwise this is the, I implore you to have a go of doing this task. Um, the I've got a sample body paragraph here um, where I've you know given examples of the topic sentence in a home in fiction, Geraldine Brooks effectively employs rhetorical conventions to engage the audience in deep intellectual exploration, shaping their understanding of transformative experiences through storytelling. You don't have to do that, that big idea. Take your pick from some of the ones that we discussed today, um, but that certainly fits in with the focus question. Um, yeah, you know, you can you could talk about curiosity and open mindedness as a as a gateway for transformative intellectual explorations or something like that if you wanted to. And then um, I've got an example here of just relevant context um, dot points. As I said, I'll upload the ten step analysis of the speech um, with some extra details about the context, values, purpose, and audience, so you can refer back to that. And I've also got a lot of uh, supporting materials in the lesson content for this week as well. So feel free to have a good read through those. Um, and I've given an example here, as always, of how to break down a, a teal um, with a, an example uh, from the speech and then room here for you to have a go of that. So, yeah, and I would love to, to give some feedback on these. Um, please put, put them in the Google Doc and I will give feedback on those. Or you can choose to do the creative writing and reflection, um, as I spoke about earlier. So they're just the creative writing task, little analytical task where you choose your three features that you will incorporate into your creative piece. Um, so, for example, you could choose metaphor. You could do a, a certain extended metaphor or something like that. Uh, you could do a personal anecdote, first person language, um, or you could do visual imagery as your third one. So any of those devices that we've spoken about that you think would fit nicely into a creative task focused on, I've chosen the quote, I am after nothing less than eternal truths. What is this world? How can we more perfectly describe it? Who are we? Who have we been? You don't have to include that quote in your writing. It's just a stimulus. So Think about that quote and what it means, what it might mean for your character and their quest as, a, as an individual. Um, so I've given the idea here that, you know, for example, uh, when you're if you're using your three chosen stylistic features and one key idea from the speech extract, you could, for example, write a piece from the perspective of an individual who had an unexpected transformative experience that enabled them to recognise their previously limited perspective of themselves, others, or an aspect of their surrounding world. So that kind of, I've given an example of the kind of creative piece that could lend itself to that, that kind of, those kinds of stylistic features that, um, that I just uh, explained to you then. Um, room there to, for you to write your piece and then your reflection task. Reflect on how you incorporate one key idea from Brooke's speech, as well as the three chosen stylistic features. Use specific examples from your creative writing piece as evidence to support your reflection. It's only short, 150 words. It's just showing that you can reflect on, on your own writing, the, the composition process of your own writing and justifying why did I make these choices? Why did I choose to use a personal anecdote? How did that allow me to achieve my purpose? Um, you know, why did I choose to use uh, visual imagery? What was the effect in relation to this particular quote that, you know, an example from your piece? Um, so yeah, have a go. This is, reflections are more and more common these days uh, because, uh, you know, teachers want, to see that you can reflect on the process and that you can, um, you know, validate the choices that you've made and that you're aware of why you made certain choices. You're not just doing it to get the task done. You're actually thinking consciously about your own processes as a writer. Um, okay. So that is, uh, wraps it up. Um, as I said, please have a go of these. Um, if you want some feedback on them, I'm more than happy to give feedback there's nothing more than I, I do love when I jump into those Google Docs and someone's uploaded something that I can give some feedback on. Um, 
it's it's nice to engage with students' work 